to show you how to approach something like this, right? This is, I think this is 1B, I think, right? All I'm thinking about is this function from here to here. That's my from here to here, right? Now, just the quickest way probably is to say uh, it's a trapezium. You may not remember your trapezium formula, but it's not hard. <laughs> Almost. Okay. okay, now just be careful. Because um, oh, yeah. you know how every formula uses H for different things and A and B for different things. So here, what is the height of my trapezium? Oh, four. Yeah, it's, it's this distance here, four, isn't it? Right. So I'm going to go four over two. What are A and B? They are the parallel signs, which are. I'm going to do them one at a time. Uh, four. I'm going to go left, right. Four and eight. Right. So that's two times twelve, which is. <laughs> um, you're going to get given shapes where it's like, this isn't even a function, it's a whole bunch of different things. But you just need to consider the areas. Areas, that's what this is about. Okay. However, this whole topic would stay rather plain if all we did was shapes that you already know how to find the areas of. Right? We could do a lot more with this process of integration, right? So I'm going to try and show you the insight that was developed which just blew the door open on this, okay? Now, I'm deliberately going to choose a very, very simple example so you can follow the math so you don't get lost. But we are going to do some fairly hard thinking, okay? So hold on to your hat. Draw this up for me. This is a travel graph, okay? Now, some of you have seen travel graphs before, some of you have not. It simply tracks, <coughs> excuse me, the motion of an object over time, okay? Like where is it at a given time? The reason why I'm appealing to this is because the idea of gradient, right? Gradient being rise over run, which we write in fancy notation as dy on dx, change in y, that's rise, change in x, that's run. This gradient relationship is exactly analogous to something that a travel graph tells us about. Namely, in terms of things moving around, gradient is how something is changing in regard to something else, which is exactly what speed is, right? What is speed comparing? The changes of two different things. Distance and time. Very good. <coughs> Excuse me. So for instance, if I travel for five hours and I pass, you know, 80 kilometers in distance, then I've <coughs> excuse me, my speed will be 80 over 5, which is 16 kilometers an hour, right? So speed equals distance on time. Now, I'm going to take this idea, and we're going to try and squeeze some insights out of it, okay? Now, have a look at this travel graph with me. What I want you to consider is, uh, we start at a time zero, right? He starts at, this object starts some distance away from the origin, right? Wherever, wherever that is, okay? You designate some origin. After one hour, it's 80 kilometers or 80 meters or whatever unit you like, 80 away from the origin. And after three hours, it's 130 units, kilometers. Actually, we'll just go with kilometers and hours away from the origin. Okay. Now, how would I work out the speed of this object? It's a constant speed. Right? I would say that the speed is, well, between the first hour and the third hour, how far has it traveled? 50. And so 50. Now, very importantly, I'm going to write down that the 50 doesn't just come from 50. It comes from 130 take away 8. It comes from that difference there, right? Where I started, where I ended. I compare those two. I take the difference, and that's what gives me the total distance. I'm going to divide that by what was the total amount of time that I was traveling to cover that. And the answer is 2. And where does the 2 come from? Answer, 3 take away 1. Right? So it's this quantity here. 3, take away 1. That gives you 50 over 2, which is 25. And I suppose I could call that kilometers per hour. Okay? That's the speed that I'm interested in. Now, I want to take this idea of speed, right? If I've got speed here, because this is a constant uh, travel graph, it's traveling at constant speed, it's not very difficult to draw, rather than a graph that has distance against time, I could compare, compare speed to time. Okay, so just really quickly, underneath here, right. okay. it's a yes, okay, I can draw, whoops, I can draw, rather than a time, sorry, time distance graph, right, I can draw a time speed graph, okay, now the speed is always 25 kilometers per hour, so it happens to be a very, very boring graph, it looks like this, 
Yes, interesting, right? Okay, now, here's the important thing I want to get across to you. Actually, many important things, one of many. This is time distance, and this is time speed. Now, you remember I was trying to say, speed is just that how you're changing, which is exactly what gradient is telling you, right? So I could call this, for instance, if this is my original function, then this is the gradient function, right? So I would call that f dash. Are you okay with that? Yeah. So distance, the function, speed, the gradient function, right? The derivative. And both of these are x's, okay? Now I've drawn them, that's why I've drawn them vertically opposed to each other, just the same way that you have drawn um, f and then compared it to f dash. Okay, no big deal. Okay. Now, here's where we're going to push on this and try and squeeze some inside out of it. If speed equals distance on time, then it doesn't take that much imagination to try and solve this in reverse order and say, what's distance equal to in terms of the other two? Speed and time. The answer is, yeah, you just multiply time across, right? So I would say uh, speed times time. Okay, does that make sense? So for instance, if I were to solve this particular question, but solve it in reverse, right? I could say, well, Let's come down to this graph here, and for one is going to go to about there, right? And three is going to go to about there. Okay. So this here, what am I solving? For this particular set of numbers here, I had a distance of 50, that distance there, over a time of two hours. Do you agree with that? So what I had was um, distance was 50, right? Speed was 25. And I was traveling for two hours. Okay. Now here's the crucial insight. Okay. We know what this means on this graph. It's about gradient. What does this mean on this graph? The answer is this statement here should look familiar, shouldn't it? Right back to the beginning of this lesson, I drew this thing. Right? And I said that multiplication is really about well, it's, it's used to understand area, right? Area. 50 equals 25 times 2. This is an area, isn't it? What area is it? Area area rectangle. It's the area of this guy in here. It's the area under this particular oh. curve. Do you see that? Between the two. This area under the curve is what this tells me. Okay. <coughs> now, I knew all of the numbers here. I knew exactly what was happening here. And therefore, I could draw some conclusions off of this, right? But what this is suggesting is that, like, how did I go from here to here? Answer, I differentiated. That's how, that's, that's what speed is, right? I differentiated going down here. In order to work out the area from this, right, all I need to know from here is, now, stop, stop, stop. What is on this, in this, I've got three numbers here. Which one's the actual area? 50, right? That is the actual area. Where does 50 appear on this graph? Answer, yeah, and this is why I, I highlighted this, right? It's the total distance covered, right? It's the start point and the end point compared, right? That distance there, this is the area down here. So, what's going on here, right? Uh, I've chosen a simple example. I chose a straight line, okay? It wasn't even inclined off like that. That's why I just got a simple rectangle, okay? But if I want to work out the area under the curve, all I need to work out is having gone backwards from differentiating, which we gave this a name. We called it anti-differentiating, right? From here to here, all I need to know is a start and end point. A start and an end point, okay? Now remembering that to go from f to f dash is differentiating, right? I can just rename these things, right? If I call this the actual function I'm interested in, let's call this f, right? Then the function I came from that differentiates down to this guy is the primitive. I call him capital F, right? So if I start with this and I want to know this area under the curve, if I can know about the thing that was anti-differentiated to get to, to climb up the ladder, all I needed is these two values, okay? So, therefore, how would I state, by the way, how would I state this area under the curve? Like, I knew numerically what it is, but in integral language, which is all about 
areas under curves. How would I state it? Number one, start the integral sign. What are my boundaries? One, one, three. One, three. From one to three. Right. Twenty-five. Now the thing I'm integrating is this guy, right? F of x. And I'm doing that with respect to x. There's those little widths across, mm -hmm. right? Now what is it actually equal to, right? Well, I needed the start point. I need the end point. Really, it's end take away start. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, where did I get 80 and 130 from? They came from these values, 1 and 3. Right? Do you agree that if this is 1, then 80 is f of 1? Do you agree with that? Like, that's the vertical part. And this guy is f of 3. So to get that 50 that I was after, the 50, which is the actual answer, I just have to do f of 3 and take away f of 1. I just need the start and end points of the primitive. That will tell me the area of the actual function I'm interested in. Okay? 